morning, everyone. Uh, nice to have an opportunity to come and, and join you here and uh, tell you a little bit about some of the things that I've been up to. Um, I've got, I think, 20 minutes and we're running a little bit late, so maybe even less to cover about uh, 40 years of involvement in high performance sport and more recently in, in the public health and trying to promote physical activity to address some of the chronic disease and health challenges that we as a, as a country face. Um, you know, I first started running when I was about 12 or 13 years of age. Um, I'm the eldest son of the eldest son of the eldest son, and I have six siblings. And my father knew that he was at risk of heart disease. His mother died in her 40s of a heart attack. And he dragged me out of bed early in the morning, 6, 6.30 in the morning when I was a, a young fella, and I used to hate it. And it wasn't long before I decided that the only way I was going to have to be able to avoid getting up early and running with my dad was to actually start doing cross country and athletics at school. So I started running after school with a group of mates at, at Burke Hall down in, down in Melbourne. And I still didn't really enjoy it very much, but at least I didn't have to get up so early. But gradually, I started to see my performances improving. And, and I started to get incredible motivation and enjoyment and inspiration, I guess, personal inspiration, from seeing my times come down and my places in cross country get better and better. And then I started to win a few races as a, as a 16 year old, a few inter school cross countries. And I was pretty much committed to the, the course that followed on. Uh, I was very fortunate to have a number of inspirational and amazing people in my life. My father was one of my greatest supporters, um, not only in terms of you know, getting into running and marathons and things himself, but also in terms of setting me on a, I guess, a, a moral compass. Uh, when I was about 16, I went for a whole season without losing. And I was starting to think that I was pretty good. And my old man came to me one day and he said, he said, Rob, I want you to stop running. I want you to give it away. And I said, I, what? I can't believe it. I've been used to dragging me out of bed, kicking and screaming. I used to hate doing it, but you'd make me go out and run and now you want me to give it away. What, what's the story? And he said, you're getting a big head. You're too full of yourself. You think you're too good, and that's not good. So I want you to stop training, stop running. And this bike was, you know, sort of a, a bolt out of a clear blue sky, and it just really floored me. And it made me realise that um, it doesn't matter how good you are, that's not what's important. There's other things that are really the most important priorities in terms of your, everything you do. But for me, at that age, as a young fella, who was running pretty well. And then I came across another guy, Pat Clovesi, who was a sports master or history master at, uh, at Xavier College. And Pat was an, another unbelievably inspirational and uh, uh, motivational type person. Pat also had a, a very similar value. I remember racing over in Europe and we had a guy from from uh, Aubrey Wood on with Pat Scammell, who was a top 1500 metre runner. And, uh, and Pat was long, had long legs and he was notorious for getting into races and causing other runners to fall over. And he had this big race over in Europe. And John Walker was a world record holder at the time from New Zealand. And John Walker went up to the organisers of the race and said, I don't want Scamble to run in the race, it's too dangerous. And Pat was livid. Pat was coaching Scam. And he went to Walker and he said, every runner has dreams and aspirations, regardless of how good, whether you're a world record holder or not, you have no right to try to stop him racing. Just as an example of the sort of character and the sort of, uh, of this moral integrity that I was very fortunate to have an opportunity to be exposed to as a young fellow. 
I went on and did a science degree and was one of the first employees here at the AIS with, with Dick Telford when there was no buildings except the, the main stadium. And then you know, I had a chance to work with an incredible group of sports medicos and sports scientists here, Peter Fricker and, and Craig Bird and many others who have come through these, uh, this establishment. I've always believed that the AIS and my opportunity to su be successful came out of an incubator type approach. Had an incredibly concentrated group of training partners, inspirational people like Clo and Dick and all of the others here. And that allowed me to do the training that, uh, that was necessary. But I ask myself often, you know, what was it about me that allowed me to be successful in one of the toughest sports in the world, in the marathon? Because I see myself as a pretty average sort of a, a person. Certainly, if a sports scientist, if Alan Hart had come to me with the Talent ID program, back when I was 16 or 17 and looked at me and said, is this guy going to be a marathon runner? I would never have made it. You know, a big, solid, muscular frame. My running style was ungangly. They used to say when I won the Commonwealth Games up in Brisbane, one of the commentators said I was, I was running like I was tearing undergrowth from the path in front of me. So probably not quite a beautiful textbook biomechanical style. Um, so, you know, in, a, in an event which is dominated by the Africans and even back then, through some incredible African athletes. Uh, here in Australia, I was able to, to get to a, a level where I dominated the event through the 1980s and went on and set world records and won world championships and went to four Olympic Games and so on and so forth. So what was it about me that allowed me to be successful? Because I don't think the training was magical. We certainly were very open. We had people coming and training with us all over the, all over the world. Uh, as I said, my build wasn't, wasn't perfect. Uh, certainly didn't have access to altitude or any of the other uh, opportunities and, and heritages that some of the African runners have had. But I had an incredible self-belief. Um, I, whether it was because of the people that I grew up with, whether it was because of my you know, Swiss heritage, whether it was because of people like Pat and like my, my dad and other guys that I trained with. But I had a belief that I was not only entitled to be successful, that I was destined to be successful even at a young age. And my goal was always to dominate the event for a period of time. And, uh, and fortunately, I was able to avoid any major injury and, and major problems. Uh, I used to say that I never got injured because I didn't have legs, I had tree trunks. And the only thing I had to worry about was Dutch Elm disease. Fortunately, I didn't come across that, so I was, I was pretty, pretty lucky. But um, after I left the Institute, or after I left the, the international sphere, I took up a position here as director of the AIS just after the last drugs and sport inquiry went through the 1980s. Very interesting times back then as well. And certainly the AIS was a major focus. And then after five years as director here, um, I moved on from here and started focusing in the public health arena. Always believing that elite athletes and elite sport was a crystal goal, something inspirational and aspirational for participation in public health, but that was not backed up by the increasing levels of childhood obesity and sedentary lifestyle-related illnesses and diseases that were around. So I launched a program called Smart Start for Kids 13 years ago. So far we've conducted over 55,000 assessments, physical health assessments of primary school aged children. So we've got a massive database. And now we work with the high risk kids running a eight to 10 week after school program just with those kids, getting them away from all of their fitter peers and running physical activity and educational and building up their self-confidence and self-esteem. And now we're trying to raise funds, government funds, to target morbidly obese kids 
from our data, we know that there's about one and a half percent of the population of primary school age kids who are already morbidly obese. We want to run a family intensive intervention with, uh, with these, these kids and their families. And uh, we've just conducted a little video journal with a young girl out in Queanbeyan, uh, you know, single, single mum, uh, three, other, three other siblings. This little girl is 11 and she's 85 kilos. And the most beautiful, sweet, intelligent young girl you'll ever come across, but uh, is really struggling. And her mum's obviously obese as well. Well, not obviously, but certainly uh, the whole family is struggling with things. So trying to find ways to use physical activity, not only to promote uh, self-esteem and self-confidence, but really also to address some of the challenges that we as a nation face. In 2009, a guy came to me from Sydney, who was a, a, a film producer, and he said, do you think Aboriginal men can run like the Africans? I said, maybe, I don't know. And he said, look, I want to do a documentary, but I want to get a group of Aboriginal men and see whether we can train them and then take them to New York and see whether they can run the New York Marathon. Will you help me? So absolutely, what an incredible opportunity. So that was the genesis of this Indigenous Marathon project and the launch of the Run Into America documentary. And for those who haven't seen it, there's a little trailer here that we'll see whether we can get going for you. Robert Di Costello has embarked on a scheme to develop a culture of marathon running among Aboriginal Australians. He's just completed a recruitment drive across the country Seeking out six young Indigenous athletes, he'll try to run this year's New York Marathon. I'm going to try and do something positive because there's a lot of negative things here in Alice. He'll inspire a lot of kids. And he'll inspire a lot of adults to be better. You're making history. Through from 
our program over the last the last few years. We're now into our fourth year. We're recruiting a new group of runners as we speak, and uh, and we'll be training them up to, to take them to New York in November. And some of these slides are also from our our deadly fun runs. We have a series of of fun runs that are run by our athletes and their communities as part of the Surf for Indigenous Health and, uh, and leisure that they do with us. And, and then we take a team from each of their communities to Uluru in July and we have a National Deadly Indigenous Championships with young kids and, and adults. So the first time ever there's been an Indigenous running, a National Championship Indigenous Distance Running event. The amazing thing is that we've had such incredible representation by Indigenous Australians in all of our speed and explosive and power sports, all the footy codes and basketball and sprinting and boxing, but we've never had an endurance athlete in any sport, let alone running. So the big question that we're trying to, to answer, the question we're asking, is that can Indigenous Australians, can Aboriginal and Island Australians run long distance? Uh, I know when I started I was a hacker, I was a plotter and I used to come in the, the last half of cross country races when I first started. Distance runners aren't natural born athletes, they're trained and the talent and the ability that a distance runner has is an ability to respond to the training that you do. If you don't do the training, it doesn't matter how much natural ability you've got, you're never going to become a champion. So the challenge is for us to create a, a pathway and an opportunity for young Indigenous kids and boys, girls, men, women to do the training that their body needs to allow the physiological response, adaptability and, uh, and improvement to see whether they can run 800, 5K, 10K marathons or whatever. So they, there's an old saying that if you want to get fit, go out and run 10k. If you want to change your life, run a marathon. That's for us here in the cities. If you can imagine the challenges and the obstacles trying to do the training for a marathon some, from some of the most remote parts of Australia up in, up in Arnhem Land, just absolutely incredible. Uh, one of the guys in 2010 to Ireland, the guy second from the, the left there, from a little community called Manangrida. I said to Joanne, how's your training going? He said, oh, he's very reluctantly, was not making any eye contact with me. He said, oh, I haven't been able to train, haven't been able to run. I said, what do you mean? You, you know, the marathon's only four months away. You've got to start doing some training if you're going to run 42K. He said, oh, it's the dogs. I said, what do you mean the dogs? Nothing wrong with running with dogs. I take my dog for a run every morning. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. The dogs in Manangrida. No one runs in Manangrida. No one, no one even walks fast because the town dogs come up behind you and bite you. I thought I'd heard all the excuses why I couldn't try. So we organised with one of the local police officers in Manangrida to put Joanne in the four-wheel drive and drive him 10k out of Manangrida and drop him off in the dirt road on the way to Darwin and he'd run 10 kilometres back into, into town and then as soon as the dog saw him he'd have to stop and he'd walk the last few hundred metres back home <laughs> and eventually he relocated to, to Darwin and lived with his auntie, left his, his wife and his little two year old at, back in Manningbrooder so that he could train because of the importance and the significance of, uh, of what he was doing. He's the only person ever in Manangarita to have an Australian passport. And it took us five months to get an Australian passport for, for this, this uh, traditional Indigenous man because he didn't have all of the documentation and everything that our, our processes, our bureaucrats require, all the birth certificates and, and so on and so forth. But when he got his passport, everyone in Manangarita wanted to see it. They'd never seen an Australian passport before. So, you know, what this is about is creating an opportunity for these young, young men and women. Uh, we've now also taken a number of women. Last year, we took, uh, or the year before, we took uh, four women and 
seven men to New York and they all ran and finished the, the marathon. Last year we had a bit of a hiccup with the, the hurricane that hit New York just the, the week before. Um, and when we were over there just 36 hours before the race, with that squad of, of six men and two women, the race was cancelled. So in a couple of weeks' time, we take a group of them up to Tokyo to run the Tokyo Marathon because as one of the guys from uh, another remote community up in East Arnhem Land said, he said, we've got unfinished business. Done all this training to prepare and, uh, and now has to actually make it to the finish line. So this, this is really a process to identify amazing, inspirational, courageous individuals. Anyone who runs a marathon is pretty special. Everyone knows how hard a marathon is. Look what happened to the first guy who, who ran at Philippides. And everyone now, a marathon is one of the, the things that everyone wants to do. Well, not everyone, but a lot of people. It's on a lot of people's bucket list. I've got to finish a marathon. And it's one of the hardest things that we can do. Here we are in a world, in a, a culture, in a community where we've created comfort. And every time we turn around, we're finding more comfortable seats, and more comfortable ways to, to live. But people are, are flocking towards doing one of the hardest things they can possibly do because when you achieve something hard, it makes you feel good about yourself. The plight of Indigenous Australians, everyone knows, is, uh, is, is an incredible blight on us as a nation. The chronic disease, the diabetes, Alice Springs is the number one centre of dialysis units in the world. More people on dialysis in Alice Springs than anywhere else in the world. Uh, the grog, the violence, um, the, the ganja, incredible challenges that, uh, that we as a country face. But I have a saying that you'll never make an effort to look after yourself. And unfortunately it takes an effort if you don't feel as though you're worth looking after. You don't have any self-respect and, and personal pride and integrity in who you are why would you bother making an effort to go out and exercise or stop smoking or stop drinking? Because it is hard work. So you've got to feel as though you're worth something. And that's what running does. That's what training does. You go out and you run 5K and you come back and you feel as though you've done something and you feel just a little bit better inside yourself. And that feeling is magnified a thousand times when you cross the finish line. And when you have an opportunity to go from your remote communities to Central Park, to Times Square, and see what an incredible place the world is, and you come back glowing inside and wanting to pass that on, hopefully with the knowledge that they gained through the Cert 4 that we, we now deliver. The first time we, we did the, our Cert 4, we have four training camps. We deliver a lot of our content at our camps. And... Um, it was all paper-based. You know, we were talking, listening before to Gordon talking about technology. And a lot of our guys, English is their second or third language. And having to write English is almost impossible. So a paper-based assessment process was doomed to failure. So, so we now deliver our content and our assessments by, by video. So each of our runners have a little, little camcorder and they get their assignments through Facebook. They would have a, a whole Facebook network. They, they may come from some of the most remote parts of Australia ever in the world, but they've all got Facebooks and they've all got mobile phones and they're all social media savvy. So they, they interview the local nurse about diabetes and talk about what needs to be done. Then upload that assignment through Facebook and that gets assessed. Because I don't care whether they can write it down or not. What I care about is that they know what needs to be done and they're in a position within their community to, to make a contribution and make a difference. So it's that hopelessness, despair, which we need to find a way to, to change and that's really what, uh, what we're trying to, to do through, through the Marathon Project. And as an indication, I've just got a little clip here of one of our guys who was in the program last year and is now 
coming to, to the Boston Marathon in, in a, a month's time.
Yeah, that I've committed suicide one day right in front of me. Yeah, that hurt. Then, like, instead of haunting me, that's why I'm trying to change my life. So I want to end it so soon because my dad was only there when it happened. Yeah, I'm trying to live my life with my little sister and hopefully have a good future and have a good life. <laughs> Thank you. 